My name is Ken Johnson. I'm a planner and civil engineer from Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. And I want to talk about the social context of infrastructure in remote communities. As you can see from this slide, the challenges facing remote communities are, are quite serious and particularly in, in aspects such as food insecurity. This one slide shows the, the price of, of, oh, sorry, of, of orange juice being close to $13 for a two liter container. And that food insecurity is a fairly significant aspect for communities in the far north. Another aspect in terms of the social side is that for a very long time is that remote communities have faced inadequate and unsafe housing. And there has certainly been requests at several levels of government to um, deal with this problem. And certainly that's one aspect of the far north that I became aware of almost 40 years ago when I first went north, is that housing, the housing that is, was at the time thought to be appropriate by the government of Canada was actually quite inappropriate for the communities at the time. And this has sort of maintained an, a, a general, I guess, inadequacy in terms of potentially the type of housing and really the, the, the number of housings needed for communities in the far north, particularly in the territory of Nunavut. A fundament, in the fundamental execution of science, engineering, and applied science can, really are very unique in terms of how they're configured. Science is generally configured, as you can see in this diagram, as a starting point, and it keeps going. There is no really ending point in terms of science because that's the nature of it. You develop hypothesis and the research is continued. Comparing that to engineering, where as engineers we have a starting point and ultimately we have an ending point, and that comes when, we, when the project is finished. The, the disadvantage that quite often causes with engineers is that we leave a project when, when it's completed and we really have no follow-up. We don't know how the project ultimately unfolds in terms of its operation and maintenance and certainly that is one aspect of a project that is, really indicates its, its ultimate success is how it carries on once it is completed. Comparing that to society as it's seen in the diagram is that society has and, and, and the uh, social science has very many starting points and ending points. It is not linear. It goes forward, it goes sideways, it may go backward, but it takes a, a lot of different pathways in terms of its, in terms of how it unfolds. And one important aspect in terms of how society works or how social science works is that it takes a significant amount of time for the social side of any project to ultimately unfold and this is quite often a timeline that really is not necessarily considered in terms of projects. A particularly important part of the society or the social science is the configuration of, com of communities in the north or remote communities. From this diagram you can see that most communities have sort of a, a, a boundary that is limited usually by transportation because since community roads can be up worth upward of three quarters of a million dollars Canadian per kilometer, the construction of roads becomes very, very expensive. So you have different aspects of the community such as the airfield, such as the solid waste management area, the sewage lagoon, the water supply. So these are all sort of limited within the community boundary that would normally include places like the housing areas, the recreation areas, the community cultural areas. So if you're trying to move or separate things like the community um, housing areas and the sewage treatment areas, if you have to put in a road that's say 10 kilometers, then you're looking at spending something like better, like seven and a half million dollars Canadian to actually put this in. So these, since budgets are always limited, the, the transportation side of separating out these various parts of the infrastructure is very limiting. Another significant aspect in terms of the community infrastructure is waste management areas, the proximity of waste management areas and airfields, is that for many, it has been a guideline within the transportation industry of Canada, is that waste management areas are attraction to birds, and birds and aircraft do not mix. So certainly if you go back 20 years ago, the guideline for separation of 
airfields and, and waste management areas was eight kilometers, which of course that represents almost six, seven million dollars in terms of just a road to separate them. Over the past 15 years, that guideline has been relaxed and generally speaking, the separation of the airfield and waste management areas is, is often around four kilometers. But all these aspects in terms of the community and its various infrastructure are, 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 are much more emphasized in a remote or a northern context. But the overall remote development context includes distant communities, phenomenal growth, unbelievable costs, very limited budgets, limited accessibility, changing climate, demanding regulators, competing needs, and deteriorating infrastructures. And all of these, if you talk about distant communities, the, the communities of the Canadian Arctic and really any, I suppose, any Arctic area is that these communities are, are quite distant and in fact, the, quite often there's not, ro there's not road access between the communities. Quite often they are limited just with, with having aircraft access and in some cases that's the only year-round access. Particularly in Nunavut is that the only way you can get heavy pieces of construction equipment in is once a year with the annual sea lift once the sea ice has melted for the season. The phenomenal growth of these communities is that quite often they are growing at a rate that's substantially higher than the rest of the country. The costs are unbelievable. The one cost I like to use all the time is the cost of, a, of water and sewer in the town of Anuvik, which is in the north of the Arctic Circle in Canada. And you, the cost of water and sewer water and sewer lines in Anuvik is about $6,000 Canadian per meter, which is an unbelievable cost. The, the budgets are limited in, in all cases just because of the competing needs. I've already talked about limited accessibility, well, it being that year-round you've got only aircraft, and in, then in, in terms of the seasonal activity, it might be one or two sea lift activities over the course of the summer months. The climate is changing, and this seems to be accelerating just because of of the, um, the circumstances in the far north. Um, the regulators are certainly becoming more, well, have continued to be and are certainly becoming more demanding as they, as the, in terms of their general mandate for protecting the environment and protecting the, I guess, public health and safety for these communities. Um, competing needs, because certainly with, with the infrastructure, there are competing needs for community education and community housing. So these, these needs are in fact competing against each other. And of course with time, infrastructure will deteriorate. And in some cases, infrastructure in the far north has been around now for 50 years and certainly is it, will, it will deteriorate within that time. The infrastructure needs in remote communities as shown in this side are pipe, sewer and water systems. These are limited to some of the, to some of the only the larger committees, communities and the vast majority of the communities in the Canadian Arctic are served with truck sewage and truck water. So the individual houses have a water tank and they have a sewer tank. And these are filled up or emptied out with a truck system. Within this water level of water and sewer service, that means you need to have a, a, a good access road system. And in the Canadian North, that means you've got these large trucks that have to have gravel roads for access. The other picture on this slide shows the water supply in Carcross, Yukon, which again is a fundamental part of the infrastructure. For remote in engineering, the key principles are appropriate technology, remote context, and incremental improvement. What you mean by appropriate technology is, in, in its simplicity, is having technologies that will work under cold climates, because quite often, and it has it's happened in the past as there the techno various technologies have been applied that really cannot stand being frozen and you, just as important if something freezes you've got to be in a position to thaw it out so you if you're taking a technology from what could have been in the south and applying to to the north you generally have to be quite assured that this technology will work in cold temperatures the other side, another aspect of it is remote context. So even though you may have a technology that, could, that can work in a cold climate, the fact that you've got very remote communities is that if this technology has issues that could in fact 
limited its uh, operation that you don't want a, t a, a technology that could break down and require the attention of a of the repair or 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 some sort of um, replacement that requires the mobilization of someone from the far south because access to some communities can take the matter of days and of course if you add weather to that that could take in some cases a week or more and with water and sanitation related technologies these communities cannot really be p placed in a position where they have their say their water supply system down for a week or weeks at a time so this this context of being remote and having the technology being able to be repaired or or, or um, in terms of the repair or maintenance requires that accessibility. Another really important part of this is, is the and this replates this has some relevance to the social science is that if if possible of having technologies or improvements made in an incremental manner because quite often in these communities is that there's not necessarily a huge amount of of employment or opportunities for training so if you've got a new project to do with water and sanitation and it can be implemented over a number of years there is a top an opportunity to provide local employment for the individuals and local training and this is a you can say it can be a very important part because large projects in remote and cold region communities don't necessarily come along that often. Some of the practices of the senior governments as this side shows, and it may be a little bit uh, unkind, but many communities are finding that the demands of the senior governments are well beyond their financial and administrative needs. Certainly in Canada with the government of Canada and their mandates of some of the senior governments that these are viewed by some of the local communities as being um, very imposing and but at the same time when these 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 um, levels of government come in the, the community doesn't really understand what the intent of the of the um, the senior governments may be a very good example of this is, is has often occurred in the past where the government of Canada some of the, some of the senior government people will come in and inspect the particularly the water and san the sanitation systems and very often these systems would be non-compliant so the community the, this individual would come in leave um, behind these um, orders or these demands from the community and, and very much leave without necessarily providing the community with a complete context or a complete explanation of what they're doing because the the senior government's regulators are very often just doing their job but at the same point not necessarily explaining what their job is and providing a I guess assistance to or an instruction to the communities that will give them a sense of I guess comfort in one sense to try and work with them to make improvements to their systems. The science of wastewater technology as this slide shows is it, it deals with such things as sampling and um, there are inherent problems with in terms of the sampling where you get the the source you sample and then you send it off to a laboratory a classic example i've seen of this is that some of the more northern communities such as the community of greece fjord on the ellesmere island in the far north to get a water sample from the community and getting it down to a laboratory for testing in or sort of the near to a laboratory in in close proximity such as yellowknife could take upward of four or five days and to get a sample that can actually be used for regulatory purposes that you generally have to have it in from the from the source to the laboratory in two days and quite often these can be delayed and that's just because the communities in terms of their accessibilities that getting from one community down to the main communities takes can take time and this has certainly been can be at the mercy of weather. So having these sort of transportation type of issues with the regulation often causes or, or really bring, brings to question as to the, the sampling criteria that's used in some cases. From the applied science perspective, certainly you can see in this photo that in principle you've got various types of technology that can be used, such as the, what's shown in this photo, which is the 
a sequencing batch reactor. Generally speaking, this type of technology may not be appropriate for the far north because it is, it is, it is generally expensive to build, but really more importantly is that it's very expensive to operate. And these, these communities don't necessarily have the funding to operate it, but even more important is they, they may not have the technical resources to operate it, meaning the human resource side of having a, not just one operator, but a series of operators that can cover off when someone may be out of town. So having these human resources available is, is a challenge and certainly will probably remain a challenge for the communities of the far north for quite some time. Another aspect in terms of the applied science or the engineering is, is always talked about is that most of the communities in the far north of Canada are serviced by trucked water and truck sewage. So the, and th with this type of system is that you have to have a road system that is fully maintained. And this becomes quite an issue when you've got during winter conditions, when you could have a blizzard in the community that could in fact cut off the access to the water and sanitation. And with blizzard conditions, during the blizzard itself, the access may be cut off, but even equally as important is that after the blizzard, you've got a snow clearing exercise that has to be completed. And this can take days. As I've already talked about the, um, in terms of the wastewater practices, is that in say the community of Greece Fjord, you've got a sewage retention lagoon in the most northerly community of Canada. And this, generally speaking, this technology is is a lagoon system where you've got retention for most for about a, I guess a year where the natural processes treat the sewage during the warm summer months and this is often limited to just a period of possibly um, 10 to 14 weeks where mother nature does her thing and she does it very well in terms of biological activity but um, there, there's a very narrow window in which the um, wastewater treatment can occur. The social science in terms of the community organization, you have communities which every community must have a mayor and council, but in support of that mayor and council, you've got various government departments in terms of finance, in terms of human resources, and then of course you've got the administration of the public works, where you've got a public works staff that has to operate and maintain the water and sanitation infrastructure. And regardless of the community sides, all of these resources are needed. But what, what often happens in northern communities is that these resources are not, not completely staffed and they're very often sort of shorthanded in having to find resources from other, or, or make up for these other resources by using other departments to do that but the communities really need this level of infrastructure support so that they, they can operate their water and sanitation systems to the, the best they can. But in terms of the social science of wastewater, as well as that this next slide shows the relative cost of water in three communities across the Canadian North, talking about Greece Fjord in the far North, the community of Wati in the, I guess, further south, and then comparing that to the city of Edmonton. So if you're looking at the community of Greece Fjord, they're paying upward of 6.4 cents per liter of water and sewer that is, that is processed. In the community of Wati, which is in the further south, they're paying around 2.3 cents per liter. And so, so you've, between Greece Fjord and Wati, there's a almost triple the value, but if you compare it to what the cost of water is in the city of Edmonton, which is another thousand kilometers south from Watee, it's only at 0.12 cents per liter. So we're dealing with relative amounts of, of, of orders of magnitude in terms of cost, with water being potentially at least 10 times more expensive in Wati, but if you go up to Greece Fjord and compare that to Edmonton, you're probably looking at about 40 to 50 times more expensive, which is huge and has a very significant burden on the community in terms of, 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 of the community paying for the supply of water. Certainly there is a significant subsidy of 
water and sewer in, Can in, in the Canadian North, and this is recognized, but still this, this sort of order of magnitude increase in the cost has a significant community or a social aspect. That's the end of my presentation, I guess, with the words that the ecosystems of the remote regions of Canada are certainly unique and fragile and must be protected. However, there, is, there, there has been, I guess you can say, a disconnect between the necessary science, applied science, and social science information that is needed for these communities to flourish in um, these modern times.